Uh, first of all, welcome and good afternoon to you all. Um, those who don't know me, I'm Tom Barton and I'm director of, of the Get It Right initiative. Um, and this is our third joint session with Zurich uh, and our second virtual one. Uh, first of all, could I apologize for the glitches in the invitation? Um, not to put too fine about a point, but it's somebody decided they'd try and make a little bit of mischief. So I um, so we decided to withdraw the invitation and, and resend it with the person who decided to make some mischief um, not being involved. So I'm sorry about that. Um, it's just one of those things and that's the world we live in. You do wonder what they get out of it. So um, you would have received some instructions in the joining instructions. So as I said, please mute your microphone and disable your video except when asking a question. Uh, this is being recorded, by the way, just so you know that. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please please click on the participants tab and you can then put your hand up and we will come to you basically. So um, I just then first slide, please. So I just uh, to the, some many of you will know this and forgive me for that, but quite a few of you don't. So um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background to those of you who don't know anything about Geary. So we did a research project a few years ago now, which showed that the industry wastes around 21% of its turnover on correcting errors. So that's about 22 billion pounds each year, which is a huge amount of money. And that's not, unfortunately, we're not unique uh, in, in this country. Um, the United States recently did a, 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 issued a publication which showed that they're wasting 17%, so certainly of a similar magnitude. So that's pretty bad news, basically. So could I have the next slide, please? So um, we, as a result of the pr dealing with the problem with error, um, a, a few years ago now, uh, four years ago, nearly four years ago, uh, a group of us decided to set up the Get It Right initiative. Uh, and as it says on the slide, uh, our aim is to improve construction, productivity and quality by eliminating error. That's our strategic aim. I'm not going to talk about it anymore today, uh, and I, but I'm happy if anybody wants to find out more about our activities to come back to me afterwards. You can see uh, our website and an inquiry form there. So, uh, but uh, as you will see uh, shortly, um, we're quite a wide group of people. Next slide, please. So these are our aims and objectives, which is to create a culture and working environment to get it right from the start, change attitudes and, and to harness leadership responsibly, responsibility to reduce error, engaging all stakeholders, and that includes, of course, the insurance world, sharing knowledge, and I think that's another area which we might talk about a little bit today, and improving skills across the sector to create a positive approach, approach to preempting error. Um, so um, can we have the next slide, please? Um, so um, we current membership is 56 members uh, and you can see it's quite a wide range of people there. Government advisory bodies, clients, architects, uh, anyway, all, uh, quite a very wide range, I say, including lawyers and insurers and insurance brokers. So the next slide, please. So this is our current membership. I'm sorry, the slight glitch in the bottom right hand corner. But um, as you can see, it's a very wide ranging group. Many of you will recognize many of those companies, um, but it's a, a key. Uh, so, so as I say, very wide ranging. So could I have the next slide, please? So why today's webinar? So very simple, really. If we make less mistakes, it reduces our insurance claims. And if we reduce our insurance claims, that reduces premiums and eventually it will reduce our costs. So because premiums quite obviously are higher than claims paid. And I also wonder whether insurance makes people complacent. Um, and it's also true, although this is not really the subject of today, but Grenfell, in post Grenfell, some issues are unlikely to be uncovered by insurance under the new Building Safety Act. Uh, and premiums are rising and not all issues are covered by insurance. So we've all got something to learn. And insurers have a huge knowledge base as to what can go wrong. So we ought to be able to learn something from them. So can I have the next slide, please? So we need insurers. We need to help insurers to help us. So you know, we're looking forward to hearing what some of our colleagues have to say and then the discussion afterwards. Now, it's fair to say that um, quite a lot of today is going to be about roads, but the reality is that um, we face the same issues, whether we're in roads or, uh, or or main buildings or whatever we might be wanting to, 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 to look at. So I think it's all very relevant and it's relevant whether we're in the construction side or uh, on the design side. 
So um, with that, um, I'm going to hand over to Robert and Matthew, who's going to take us through the presentation today. So thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Tom. Um, so yes, so um, it's myself, Robert Innes, um, Senior Construction Risk Engineer from Zurich, and Matthew Porter, who's um, an Executive Adjuster for our claims team. And we're just going to take you through um, this webinar. Um, and like Tom says, if you've got any questions, then pop them in the chat function and we'll try to get them either at the, during the presentation or at the end. So as Tom says, um, to, for us, one of the um, key areas to help try and reduce errors um, and all the associated costs with this is to try and share knowledge. And this is something that we're quite keen to do in Zurich because we have obviously access to a lot of claims information where things have gone wrong and we see a lot of uh, best practice when we go and visit sites. So this is something that we want to try and share with the construction industry. And, you know, Giri is a, a great vehicle to, to do this. So this is what we're hoping to do. We've done one on escape of water and today this is more of a sort of civil infrastructure type um, presentation and we'll continue to do this um, as long as there's an appetite for this. So what we really want to do is just focus on sharing our experiences and not just that, just look at ways we can you know, help try and minimise these losses. And a particular focus on today's um, webinar is also just to provide a sort of educational piece with insurance, because obviously we're not just looking at this from a technical point of view. We do have obviously our insurance background and we just want to share some interesting points of note from an insurance point of view. So we'll be doing that as we go through the presentation. So I'm just going to hand you over to Matt because we just discussed something that we do at Zurich called the loss lesson scenario, which kind of sort of inspired this presentation. OK, thanks, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I mean, this this slide is pretty much, uh, you know, as it says, um, we run these workshops with clients. It's predominantly annual uh, policy customers, but we would also undertake these for any client um, who has taken out a project policy with us and who wants to have a, a, a loss scenario session just to run through issues that concern them uh, against the current policy wording that's in play there. Um, we basically ask clients in, in either circumstance what, what keeps them awake at night from an insurance perspective and we then collaborate with them to build a suitable scenario and, and that forms the basis of the, the, the loss lesson session. Um, now from a benefit perspective, you know, it enables the, the policy holder to better understand their, their cover and the extent of their cover before they get into a situation where they have a claim and it also fosters, you know, a relationship uh, between the insured and the insurers. I mean, it, it, it helps, I think, and from experience, it definitely has helped in terms of having uh, met somebody and discussed issues with somebody prior to having a, you know, a substantial claim with them potentially. Um, and I think it can be a very, very, very beneficial and powerful process, especially if we see uh, coverage gaps identified during the session and put right, it, as Rob alluded to earlier, it's an educational aspect in terms of coverage concepts and specific clauses. And also, um, my view is that if the outcomes are shared internally within the contracting organisation, um, you know, and that's outside of insurance and risk management teams, and if you're sharing that feedback with people at the sharp end of construction uh, work being undertaken, so project managers and engineers, to, to name a couple of examples, that I really can see being a benefit in terms of helping people understand the, the insurance claim process and helping to sort of isolate and collate costs and technical material required to evidence a claim. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very, very important uh, part of it. Um, so why do we why are we doing this with Jiri? I mean, it's to further highlight claims areas that we see commonly and how you might want to try and mitigate them. Um, and you can tie these claims in with 
common insurance policies and, and give you a bit of education in terms of the in, more interesting insurance policy aspects. And, you know, there's there's quite a, a varied number of these and we'll we'll get to cover in the session. And I'll hand you back to Rob. Okay, so, um, like I said, we're going to focus on sort of road sort of civil infrastructure projects, but I'd be interested um, just as a bit of what your thoughts were on on your own experiences of those listed from earthquake down to other um, what you would what do you believe are the most common loss events seen by the insurance industry so if you could just type away into the chat function um, what you think the um, most common uh, losses are just be interested to see what you think Okay, so okay, it's interesting. Um, so a lot of people have put defective design and um, and flood. So and then what I wouldn't just be interested to say. Um, so those are the most common losses that you would see on a project. But of those losses, what would you say is the most costly per claim? So as an individual claim, what would cause you the most uh, biggest loss on your project? So if you could again, if you could just write in the chat function, that would be quite handy. So again, a lot of people just seem to be saying defective design. This is also just let you know this is pre um, this this information was actually taken pre um, twenty twenty. So um, COVID and business interruption um, would may or may not skew things of this year. So and just obviously this is what we see in Zurich and we are an international business so although we obviously a fair amount of our claims would be in the UK we do have international business hence why earthquake and typhoon and that might be relevant and that hence why it's in the poll okay so if I just go back to okay so what I'll just show you now is so if you can see um this is the table just showing you what our most common claims are so there it's um descends from the value per claim so fatality is actually our biggest um, claim value per claim. So that's at 166,000 on average. You see there's only one. So, um, But actually what you'll see is the most common form of claim that we see on these type of projects is storm damage. Um, so again, we saw 59 claims in one year, um, massing up to 3.8 million um, in total. So although it's only 64,000 per claim, this is sort of a highlights a sort of high frequency, low impact kind of low cost impact um, kind of claim, but you can see it mounts up, whereas fatality would be uh, low, low, low frequency, high value. And again, so you can see again, the second and third ones highlighted in, in light blue are defective design and then flood. So those top three, storm, defective design and flood, would be our most common claims that we see. So what we're going to do now is just take you through a few of those common ones um, with an additional two on workmanship on hot weather. And we're just going to go through them and just pick out a claim, highlight any interest areas of interest, and then just identify some potential mitigation measures. And then Matt's going to take you through some sort of interesting points on the policy that you may or may not be aware of that sort of may shape your thinking going forward. So we'll look at the first one. So storm, obviously, with the most common, it seems um, appropriate to start with this one. So we have this project um, and this is a large project. Um, it's a permanent road that's being constructed and they're using um, temporary access roads that were also being installed. And we're just going to focus in on it suffered two major storm events, um, winter and summer of the same year. Um, and it caused significant amounts of um, damage and delay. So just the, the particular details of this. So in December, um, in the preceding month, 
it had about 115 mil of rainfall, so just slightly above the monthly average, but not as high as it has historically seen. Um, but then in the last month in January, you'll see that it suffered 225 mils of rainfall, which is significantly above the, um, the highest on record. So those two months combined caused significant damage. And what that caused is significant standing water on the work areas. And that's what you can see in the photo. Um, and effectively it damaged a significant amount of earthwork materials, re rendering them unusable. A lot of the access roads were damaged, which meant access to the site was not feasible. So again, these had to be um, repaired and all the standing water had to be removed in order just to gain access to the site, let alone um, carry on with the preceding, preceding works. Um, and again, it suffered again another significant rainfall in the summer, which caused again um, similar similar amounts of damage. So again, there's not much. I mean, storms are going to happen. There's, you can't prevent a storm, obviously, but there are things that you can potentially do that can help reduce the impact. So um, we saw um, a lot of storms in Queensland, Australia, um, in mid 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 2010s. And as a result of this caused huge amounts of uh, losses for the insurance industry. So in Queensland, it's now mandatory that all road and other civil infrastructure projects have to have a severe weather, weather management plan. So this just outlines all the emergency procedures, all the measures that will be in place to try and mitigate um, the, the impact of a storm. So again, it'll have how weather monitoring, how often that's taken place. Um, emergency action plan, what do you do with your plant and equipment, where are you storing your plant and equipment, just to make sure that if you were to get an event, that it's not going to be damaged. Um, so this is something that we would be looking for, especially from the insurance industry, that projects of this type to have and to develop and to maintain throughout the project, such that if an event were to occur, it gives us confidence that there's procedures in place to deal with this. We'd also just look at access routes so sometimes the permanent works may not be damaged but actually the access routes to the project will be damaged because they're not of the similar construction to the permanent works so again we would just advise just to look at the form of construction and sort of what redundancy and what alternatives do you have in your access road such that if the access road were to be sort of out of play how are you actually going to proceed with your project so it might not damage your permanent works but it may cause you significant delays and this is what we often see with storm events and something that we consider and we sort of ask for um, when we're looking at these projects is the extent of earthworks that are exposed at any one time. So if you can limit how much of your earthworks is exposed to storm damage, i.e. it's not sealed, it's not got its waterproofing on, etc., cetera, um, then that's something that we would be interested in that we consider such that because we have to look at sort of scenarios that um, that might go wrong. And if we know that you've got a 50 kilometer road, but only two kilometers of earthworks will be exposed at any one time, then that's something that would be, you know, work, would work favorably when determining premiums and loss scenarios, etc. So just something worth considering. And again, just looking at your permanent drainage, installing that at the earliest opportunity, but also installing temporary drainage. So having trenches, diversion ponds, and not just installing them, just making sure you have regular frequent inspections, um, of them to make sure that if they are required that they they can work as as needed and again we would just be looking to ensure that all plant and equipment and site compounds aren't stored in susceptible areas so um basically avoiding low points so these are just some of the things that we'd be looking at from a loss mitigation so i'll hand you over to matt and he'll just go through some of the policy interesting points okay thanks rob um i'd just like to highlight at the outset that all references to policy coverage today in our discussion relate to contractors all risk or erection all risks uh, policy forms and, and those will uh, most likely include third party or public liability cover. Um, generally the, the, the gateway to trigger these policies is damage to ensure property occurring during the period of the policy. Um, on this particular uh, claim scenario, um, 
the issue over unexcavated material um, came up in terms of whether that was or was not insured property. Now, I think the, the insurance industry are fairly firm on this particular point. Um, no is the short answer. The insured property has to be something worked upon or created and of value. And we find this scenario comes up uh, fairly frequently on road contracts where the, the sort of construction methodology is cut to fill. If you had a situation where you'd excavated material on the alignment and you would stockpile that ready for placement, that is probably likely to be classed as insured property. Any material excavated and placed on the road alignment will definitely be insured property. But it, it's quite an interesting, an interesting point. Um, this was a this was a project policy. And you've heard me talk about project policies and annual policies. Um, we'll get into the sort of difference between the two a little bit more later on. Um, generally, there's no plant and equipment cover in project covers. So. Uh, if you were someone working on a contract uh, where there was a project policy in place, you would need to make sure that your own cover was in place for those kind of exposures. Uh, some contractors um, are able to uh, to purchase what's called standby, sorry, standby, yes, yeah, standby cover for plant and equipment in your, in their annual covers. Generally. There's been a move away from the the kind of uh, aspects of looking at that as a consequential loss within these covers, and it can be purchased. But generally, you won't you won't find the plant and equip, equipment cover in place in project policies, and hence you wouldn't be able to um, pursue any claim for stand standing or idle time. Um, that of course would be different if the plant cost was actually specifically incurred in relation to reinstatement of the road alignment for some reason. Sometimes we see that that is just a, uh, a misclassification from, from clients submitting claims. But if it is pure standby time, it, it won't be covered under the policy unless you're one of the lucky few contractors that have that cover available under their annual cover. Um, number of deductibles. Uh, that is quite an interesting point in terms of, generally speaking, any natural peril such as storm, earthquake will have what is called a 72 hour period trigger. So any damage occurring within a 72 hour period can be aggregated together and is subject to one deductible. Um, and, and that is often at the election of the of the of the insured. Um, in this case, the the level of deductible is relatively low. Uh, there were eight 72 hour period storm events. So 25,000 pounds times eight, 200,000 pounds, not a massive amount of money, but I think it's just worth pointing out. And this was uh, this was teased out in discussion with one of our underwriting colleagues that this was a fairly historic project when deductible levels were fairly low. I think everyone uh, on this webinar is probably aware of the fact that the market has changed quite significantly. Um, the deductibles for storm would be significantly higher. Uh, comparable projects now will probably attract a figure of at least £100,000, maybe up to £250,000. So the impact of that would be, would be, as I said, fairly significant. Um, in terms of uh, delay, where you have uh, a project delay and startup cover, so this is the sort of construction version of business interruption. There will be a generally a pre-agreed um, methodology in terms of cal calculating loss revenue. Um, and we will always, as a claims department, evaluate the actual delay caused by damage to insure property. If it doesn't, if a delay is not tied to those, those aspects, uh, it won't be considered under the DSU claim. So just an example, other delays such as failure to obtain environmental permits. Again, that's not related to reinstatement of damaged property or failure to carry out utility diversions essential for the works. They would not count towards any delay. Um, if these delays caused, say, for example, approximately one year out of an 18 month overall delay, 
the policy would in essence only respond to six months of lost revenue. I think it's just an important thing to pe for people to be aware of. Um, in terms of adjustments, again, as previously mentioned, previously mentioned, the policy only responds to damage to completed works. So if you haven't built it, it is not going to be something that insurers will indemnify you. And indemnify means to put you back into the position that you were prior to the loss. Um, we often see adjustments for basically works that have not been undertaken. So hence they're not being reinstated and they don't fall for cover. Uh, other aspects such as unit rates for labour and plant feature quite heavily, as do uh, things like overhead and profit. There's generally uh, a discussion over those aspects uh, with the loss adjuster and the insurers when we're coming to, to, to settle out a loss. Um, uh, also, in terms of some of the additional covers provided under policies, you, you tend to get some sort of additional costs, so costs over and above the original cost that would have been expended. Um, quite often, again, we find that the cost being claimed for is the cost that would have been expended, not the additional over cost. So that would be adjusted out during the course of the claim adjustment. Uh, Rob, I'll hand back to you. Yeah, um, so so we'll just talk about the second sort of common event, which is defective design. And we see this a lot with piling. Um, so again, we thought this would be quite a good example. So in this scenario, we had one project where we were piling into water. And on this project, issues um, were detected in August when they were constructing a submerged anchor beam. Um, so the issues were just um, compaction of concrete. Um, the issue wasn't fully understood, so I don't understand why, but the works continued. In the following January, they'd obviously in the interim period, they constructed over, I think it was like 37 piles. When they actually went to um, test those piles or test some of the piles, they found um, some of them had voids. When they had a look at all the piles, 37 of them had voids were inadequ inadequately compacted. So basically, there was no problems with the concrete when it arrived. The activity plans were all there and they were, they were, fo they were followed as intended. Um, and it was installed obviously using a tremi pipe, but it was actually, I think, subsequently found out that um, tremi pipe should be obviously below the top of concrete. Ideally, I think it's two meters, two to three meters. Um, but actually, it was found that the tremi pipe was um, above the concrete level, such that effectively it was falling through water, uh, which is not great for segregation. And effectively, um, a lot of the uh, piles had voids that have been formed. So again, this is something that we see um, commonly. So again, I think just in terms of loss mitigation, there's obviously the best practice guide that I think everyone should be familiar with when trimming concrete, but I just thought I'd reiterate that. And that's something we would expect you to follow on site. But again, it was just something that's just tying in with the sort of the Giri message, which is, you know, pausing for five when I, I found it it's, um, astounding that if you detect issues in, in August, and they're not fully understood that works would continue when, to me, it should be four to five. You actually really fully understand what, what, what the problem is before you continue, because it may take you a little bit longer when pausing for five, but it will take you significantly less time than having to rectify 37 piles as a result. So I just want to reiterate that message that, you know, again, just proceeding when you've got problems or just rushing when you've when you've had a problem and then trying to rush to catch up in the long term, it probably will cause you more headaches than it's worth. And just something that we see again with, with concrete pours is just looking at contingency and scenario planning. So you see a lot of risk assessment and method statements, you know, they'll outline what you should do for the works. But to me, I think a lot of um, method statements, or well, there should be scenario planning for the what if scenarios. So what if the concrete wagon doesn't turn up? What happens if you've got a problem with the the piling equipment or um, during during the pour, um, just so you know what to do, such that when these events do occur, that you know you've got measures in place and the people on the team who are actually doing the works actually know what they're doing. So I think um, these should either be included in the method statements or they should be done for your key key construction activities. And again, I'll just hand you over to Matt um, for some interesting points and discussion with regards to the policy. Hey, thanks, Rob. 
So again, um, just to reiterate, to trigger the policy, we must have damage. So the first point here is, is this particular situation a defect or is it damage as required to trigger the policy? Um, generally speaking, you know, you require a physical change in property that is detrimental or deleterious to it. Um, from, a, from an insurer's perspective, these piles and beam never existed in anything other than a defective state. So they were, they were worthless in essence. Um, it would have been possible, I think, for the contractor to argue that the concrete as it was poured through the seawater may have been lost. Um, so that's basically confines the loss to the loss of cement and fines. However, uh, further issue with this particular claim was that there wasn't any aggregation language. And we've talked about aggregation in, re in relation to natural perils such as storm and earthquake. Generally speaking, you would expect to see language in the policy wording surrounding deductibles describing uh, situations as arising from a common cause or arising from substantially the same conditions. And I think probably factually there wouldn't be any dispute that the, that the cause of the loss was the failure to insert the Tremie pipe correctly. And that was just repeated over multiple occasions. Um, so on that basis, if you haven't got any uh, unifying language in relation to the deductible, potentially you, you have a situation where you apply a deductible for the anchor beam and then one for each of the 37 piles incorrectly executed. Um, further, there was a specific piling clause in this wording um, that excluded the cost of any abandoned piling work or piles which have failed to pass a load test unless that abandonment or failure is a direct consequence of other physical loss, destruction or damage. So there was an issue there, uh, again, for the contractor to, to try and overcome. Um, in all policies, and you've heard me mention about defects exclusions, there will be a defects exclusion. There are various types of defects exclusion. That's probably uh, could be the subject of another webinar in its own right. Uh, saying that, though, um, they all state that the property insured will not be regarded as damaged solely by virtue of the existence of any defect in design, plan, specification, materials or workmanship in the property insured. So if you've got one of those particular aspects, I mean, in this case, uh, argument, strong argument from insurers is that it is just these piles are just defective. Um, they're not, they won't be treated. The language in those de in those defects clauses reinforces that point and says if it's just the knowledge of a defect, uh, it won't be treated as damage for the purposes of the policy. Um, there was a small uh, adjustment issue here. Again, it related to uh, additional overcost cover, and, and it turned out that the, the cost being claimed was in fact the actual cost of performing the work, not the additional cost that would have been covered under the policy. Um, and I'll hand you back to Rob. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so we're just looking at, um, as Matt just alluded to then, another issue that we often see is obviously workmanship. So again, on a project that we've seen, so obviously road construction involved bridges, and this particular project had some uh, post-tensioned uh, concrete bridges, and they discovered some cracking in the deck soffit. Um, so the waterproof membrane had just been installed and it was just ready to be surfaced. And the cause of this was effectively the PT ducts, post-tension ducts were misaligned. And obviously when they tensioned them, because they were misaligned, you were obviously inducing stresses into the deck that um, it wasn't exactly designed for. So then these caused um, cracks. And sometimes obviously these cracks may be acceptable, but obviously they need to be investigated. Um, in this case, they weren't, it had to be completely repaired. So you had four months of delays just to investigate it and then subsequently repair it. So what happened here was they actually had to then hydrodem out the ducts and then realign them. 
and then obviously recast the concrete. So this is obviously quite a costly um, mistake. Um, and it obviously cost about 13 million cost to the contractor. Um, again, this is just something simple, whereas if someone had just obviously just checked the alignment of the ducts as part of the pre-pour inspection, then this would have been um, covered, but obviously that wasn't done. So I think the main sort of loss mitigation we'd be looking at this is just um, just the on-site technical supervision. Um, you know, if, if it's um, self-certified work, you know, making sure you have a thorough and robust system in place to ensure that all your key, you know, construction activities are actually, there is a thorough level of um, quality checking. And obviously in this instance, there wasn't, and I would consider inst installation of the PT ducts is a significant, um, significant construction activity, because obviously once you let go and you cast those um, deck and you take away temporary works, then you know, you can get significant failures. And that's something that I think we saw in Florida when that bridge, um, the trust bridge um, collapsed. Again, that was through um, failure of PT ducts. So again, just having um, proper uh, on-site technical supervision, independent, preferably to the contractor, who can actually just go around and check um, alignment of ducts, pre-pour inspections, and making sure that it's all, everything matches the design drawings. So I'll just hand you back over to Matt again, just to pick up some policy points. Okay, so there's there's uh, fewer points of discussion uh, in relation to this claim. Um, I mean, some 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 are I think probably uh, relevant in terms of what we've already discussed. I won't go over those, even though they were probably particular features of this claim. But sort of from from a, a new point perspective. Um, losses losses that uh, losses occurring have to be accidental or unknown uh, what we refer in the insurance industry to for as fortuitous so if a contractor uh, is merrily working away he has some issues uh, and he then has a uh, definite knowledge that the, the way he's executed that work is problematic and it's caused damage um, if you still continue to work in this way, there's a strong possibility that insurers won't indemnify you for any costs that you incur after that knowledge. I think it's just an important but fairly basic point to tease out. Um, now, now, Rob obviously mentioned the, the PT ducts, they were misaligned. Again, the issue of defect versus damage um, comes into play. Uh, just as a reminder, we need damage to trigger the policy um, and if you'd simply built the ducts in the wrong place and they were misaligned that is not physical damage from an insurance perspective. Um, the subsequent uh, cracking to other areas of the bridge and the road deck as Rob alluded to if those cracks are beyond permitted uh, tolerances that that may well be viewed as damage as physical damage and would tra trigger the trigger the policy cover um, we have actually got yeah another adjustment issue so there were contractual costs submitted as part of the claim uh, that the contractor would have had to incur just to comply with these obligations under the contract um, and, and that was the case rather than it being for the reinstatement of damaged insured property. So those costs were taken out of the overall claim settlement. Uh, back to you, Rob. Okay, thanks. And I think um, one just point out just, obviously, you know, some of this is policy is very insurance related, but I think it's interesting things that people need to know on site, because obviously just again, proceeding with works um, blindly may actually be incurring you more costs. So just having a basic awareness of you know what insurance is there and what it's there for will help you so i think it's stuff that should be really reiterated to the the guys on the ground as well as just the you know management and insurance uh, managers within your organization so um just want to stress that point um again something thankfully we don't see that often um because obviously we definitely don't want any of this um, but I just thought I'd raise it again because it's just something, again, it's a very um, high, it's a costly um, area as, as, as well. Um, so this is just something that we saw on one project where um, 
they were doing some um, hard shoulder works and um, they had the lane segregated off from the main traffic and they were using that hard shoulder to, as a construction lane. And then the person um, in question, they were doing some works, installing some utility ducts around a gantry. And, um, you know, unfortunately, a dumper was passing along the um, highway lane when this person, Z person, um, stepped out and unfortunately collided with them and then unfortunately lost their life. You know, and this project had an excellent safety record. I mean, on paper, AFR zero, brilliant. They even had um, sort of, um, they even had um, measures in place that, you know, to control the traffic as it moved along. So you'd need to get, you'd have stop points, you'd have to get the thumbs up before you um, pass through those points. But even with these measures in place, unfortunately, accidents like these still happen. But I think the key thing to hear is just to, um, to note that you know, this was a supervisor who actually had been removed from the project. I don't have the reasoning why they were removed, but they were. But actually, they were brought back onto the site by the subcontractor without the main contractor's knowledge and permission. Um, so again, you've got people working on site. So again, I think the main thing you'd be looking at here is just to improve communications. Again, so communications between the subcontractor and main contractor. And again, this is reiterated by the fact that in this particular instance, the dumper wasn't actually included in the, in the use in the, in the risk assessment and method statement. And again, it wasn't included and they weren't even discussed with the main contractor. So the main contractor wasn't even aware of the person who unfortunately lost their life working on site. And obviously they weren't aware of the, the, the sort of deviation from the method statement either. So again, it's just, you know, really looking at you know, meta statements are brilliant, they're there, but it's just ensuring that they are actually being followed on site. And this is where we see a lot of um, thing where things go wrong and errors are made when we start deviating from the meta statement. And often I think there isn't enough sort of checking by say the main contractor on site that the subcontractors are actually following the approved meta statement. So in my opinion, I think there should be more sort of ad hoc checks um, during the course of the works to ensure that method statements are being followed. And then and this start seeing on a lot of um, sort of projects now the use of dual view plant and equipment. So this is where, um, say in this case, dumpers, um, you know, historically dumpers, the cab will be at the back and the, the sort of the, the dumper, um, I can't think of the word for it, the dumper, um, loader will be at the front so your uh, vision is obscured and that was the case in this instance but actually you can get dual fuel plant equipment where the cab is at the front and actually can rotate through 360 degrees so it means then when you're operating it you can have a look at the um the truck at the front but actually when you're driving it you can rotate the cab so that you're actually driving it where the cab is at the front now and it just gives you much better visibility and you know i'm not saying it would have um you know, it would have stopped this uh, tragic accident, but it would have certainly helped. So I think just consider the use of um, this type of plant equipment um, would be beneficial. And again, I'll just take you over to Matt again, just to discuss some policy points. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, so just uh, to start with, um, I would highlight that this was a, uh, a project policy wording and the impact of that is um, the number of uh, people insured under it uh, will be will be fairly significant. So in this particular policy, uh, there were five classes of insured. Firstly, the principal. Secondly, the main contractor. Thirdly, subcontractors of the principal or the main contractor. Any financiers of either the principal or the main contractor. And then number five, any other party to the extent required by contract or agreement entered into by insured one, which is the principal in connection with the project. So it's quite wide ranging in terms of who is insured under this project cover. Um, on uh, any public liability or third party liability claim uh, under a construction form, whether it be contractual risk or erectional risk, there will be an employer's liability exclusion. So this exclusion basically would exclude injury to any employee 
when the claim made by any one of the insured is in respect of injury arising out of or in the course of such employee's employment. Um, this is, as I say, fairly standard clause. So uh, if the sole liability was against the, in, the employee's own employer, they would not be able to seek indemnity under this third party liability or public liability section, primarily because under statutory requirements, they are required to hold and insure against employers liability risks. And those don't those risks don't uh, cease if you're working somewhere somewhere else other than your uh, your place of employment. Obviously, for a contractor, that could be in a, in a whole host of places around the country. However, the interesting part of this is that as you've got multiple classes of insured, they are all treated separately for the purposes of this policy cover. So in an example where another insured party, let's say uh, a subcontractor, the injured party's employer was the main contractor, assuming that a subcontractor had the potential to bear some proportion of liability, they would be treated as having their own separate right to seek that indemnity under the PL or third party liability section of the project policy cover. And, and this, this whole concept is governed by the multiple insured clause, and this is standard in all CAR or EAR covers. And that basically gives each insured party its own distinct rights to the cover, um, often the words used are to the same extent as if individual insurances had been issued to each party. I mean, this goes back to the sort of fundamental concept of um, of, of construction cover, uh, where you know you need people to work in conjunction with each other. Um, they get the benefit of the cover. They're also protected from insurers trying to recover against them if they've been at fault. It's sort of uh, it dissuades people from from signing up to, to to work on project covers if they know that they're going to be pursued for every potential negligent act they undertake. You know, we we ensure negligence. Um, so it, it's just carried through from a recovery perspective as well. Um, often the entry to the insured party status is contained within the relevant contract between the parties, and that's either the owner and the main contractor. Uh, or the main contractor and a subcontractor, which will stipulate if there's project cover and whether the contractor is to have the benefit of that cover or provide their own. Uh, and, and that will be generally provided if that's the case under the contractor or construction professional's own uh, annual cover uh, for contractors or risk or erectional risk, depending on what cover they have available. OK, um, OK, that's that's it from uh, from me on that particular example, and I'll hand you back to Rob. OK, so um, our last claim and um, this didn't feature in, in the most common claims, but I came across this and I just thought it was quite an interesting uh, claim, so I just thought I'd share it. Um, so this was um, again a highway project that was actually just getting a new wearing course and they installed um, temporary lines uh, using temporary studs, so little yellow markers. And, and it's common on every single um, high road project you pretty much see. And actually um, they suffered um, a some hot weather, um, unusually hot weather, so um, stuff that we were seeing uh, about a month or so ago. And actually what they found was um, when the vehicles were actually going over the studs, they were depressing them into the wearing course. So again, something so small, this little stud, and it ended up costing, it was estimated, um, I don't have the final cost, but it was estimated to have caused three to eight million pounds worth of damage to these little studs that it caused. And then when I just came across this claim, I just thought it was quite interesting. So I just thought I'd share that across. And again, just so when I was sort of looking at um, sort of looking at um, the sort of standards um, for um, surfacing insulation I came across uh, I, IAN 157 and it it addresses cold weather conditions so when you should be laying your asphalt 
you know, um, what to do in certain weather conditions, but they didn't address anything to do with hot weather. And again, um, because I don't think it necessarily takes into account sort of temporary materials that are bearing onto surfacing, etc. So I think it's just something, um, something to be aware of. So particularly when you do have um, uh, projects that are installing these and you do have adversely um, hot weather, um, then just something to bear in mind. So again, something so small could cause three to eight million pounds worth of damage. Um, so again, I'll just hand you back over to Matt um, to discuss uh, the policy um, points. OK, thanks, Rob. Uh, so again, we start with the question of has there been damage to insured property? Um, potentially, you know, the cost covered would be to rectify the depressions in the road surface. Although, uh, you know, first consideration, uh, these are between three and six millimetres deep with a footprint of around 60 millimetres by 100 millimetres, which is the size of the actual temporary road stud itself. Uh, are these are these depressions detrimental or deleterious to the property? Uh, I think if you were looking at it from uh, from the other side of the, of the fence, you, you may be thinking that those depressions could be affected by severe winter weather, uh, leading to wider and further issues with the road surface. Um, ultimately, we, uh, we, we, we established that the, uh, the owner or sorry, the employer had accepted the road uh, and they were going to see how things went. So I think it's unlikely that we will get a, a, a claim now. Um, so uh, further aspects to consider uh, were, were the works taken into use and, and that has a bearing on uh, a point that I just, I made on the previous example about contractual requirements about insurance. Um, if the road, if the works were taken into use, um, you need to determine under the contract uh, whose risk they were at, they were under, sorry. So if if the if it was at the owner's risk, the project policy would definitely be responding. Um, the, the, the type of contract form here, um, which was an NEC engineering and construction contract option C, um, place basically obligations on the contractor and subcontractor to arrange their own uh, all risks, contractors all risks cover, but not only to the benefit of themselves, but also the owner. Um, so there would be an issue as to which policy would respond. Um, quite often we have to determine contractual responsibility before we get to the question of um, who, which policy is going to pay. So um, I think the point I'd like to make here is that it's important to check your contract regarding responsibility for insurance of the contract works. Just because it's a project policy, don't make the, the perhaps incorrect assumption that you are insured for the purposes of that policy. Uh, if, you, if you need to have had your own insurance in place, um, have, you, have you factored the cost of that into your contract price? So again, as we as we as we mentioned just now, if we assume that the problem is at the employer's risk and the policy responds, then that again, it's a point we touched on previously. Uh, there is a question of the application of the excesses. So generally, we we would expect to see aggregation language. Uh, now, dependent on cause, um, as Rob alluded to earlier, we 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 believe that the studs were just depressed into the road surface as a consequence of cars driving over them and the uh, the road surface had heated up to a level where it had become malleable. Um, if, for example, there was a, uh, again, as we talked about previously, an issue in terms of a defect in design or workmanship, then uh, you, you will have a different deductible in play. And actually, one of the defects clauses was subject to a series loss clause, which would probably mean that all of those losses could be aggregated together and be subject to one deductible. If in this situation the cause was just the hot weather, um, that would be the standard 
deductible of £10,000. And there's no aggregating language in relation to uh, um, losses caused by uh, perils other than defects in design, plan, specification or workmanship. So potentially you would have a deductible for each and every loss, which would be each and every depression over a 12 kilometre road with eight lanes. So even if you work on the basis that it's £10,000 deductible, uh, I don't know exactly how many how many depressions were caused, but the impact of that would be significant if it was applied on that basis. OK, uh, I'll hand you back to Rob. Um, so, yeah, so we'll just um, uh, go move on to the summary. So that's just five um, fly, five sort of claims um, scenarios that we've, we that we've discussed. Um, so, yeah, so just taking this as a summary um, and just coming back to um, the loss scenario. So it's something that we would sort of recommend as engaging with your insurers early. So, again, if you do have um, an annual policy with your insurance company, just look to do um, an insurance policy um, loss scenario with them. So stress test your insurance policy before you need to do, know it rather than trying to work out after the event whether you are covered or you're, you're not covered. So as Matt said before, you know, if you have a particular project project policy or your annual policy, look at the five things that you think that will give you the biggest headache from an insurance point of view. And then that your insurer will should come up with a scenario that they can really stress your policy to work out whether you are covered or not. And it's something that, you know, I've been a part of and so is Matt and we would really highly recommend. So um, have a look at that. And again, Storm is the most common source of claim. And it's something that we have a look at and we factor into our when we evaluate and assess uh, projects from an insurance point of view, we look at quite closely. So um, any sort of um, mitigation measures, any um, procedures that you have in place to deal with these risks, again, I would just advise then, you know, these are documented. The severe weather man plan management plan would be the great start. It passes information to your insurer because it will really help them um, when they assess the risk and it will it could only be a positive when they're determining your premiums, etc. And again, just the, the giving message of pausing for five, stop and pausing for five, um, really reiterating that. So if mistakes are made, you know, you know, they, sometimes they can't be avoided. Just pause for five, think about how they happened, and rather than just trying to rush, fix them and trying to um, um, recover the time or recover the problem, because you you will likely cause other areas further down the line or eventually you'll find that you've actually caused significant problems and we've seen this with the piles and I've seen this on numerous projects and um, throughout the years and again just it's the biggest thing that we sort of when we go around and we have a look at projects is just trying to understand sort of how method statements are effectively being followed on the site so something that we would really stress is to really uh, contractors should be looking at is to ensuring that subcontractors or those carrying out the works are following method statements because method statements on paper are usually brilliant. You know, they'll, they'll tell you everything what you want to know, but what's actually happening out on the ground and in practice can sometimes vary. So, you know, and, and it, it can lead to significant claims for them in an economic point of view, but even worse still, it can lead to fatalities, which it did in this case. So, you know, these are just some of the key points that we just like to stress. You know, Matt's made some excellent. Um, insurance points so i hope you found them quite informative so um we'll just move you on so we've got half an hour for questions if um people want to um ask questions um, i can't see the chat so i don't know if anyone's asked questions but um if anyone has any questions either raise your hand or and then um, i'm sure uh, tom can um can sort of um divvy out who which questions are asked first Yep, I can. I'm just trying to um, get. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yes. Right. OK, so uh, somebody's asked um, in terms of claims against defective or damaged items, does it mean that any design and or installation that was non compliant to start with will make it exempt from a claim? Uh, the short answer to that is it depends on what defects cover you purchase. So uh, I, I made reference to that during the course of the of the the webinar. Um, it probably is a subject in its own right, 
but there are a whole suite of defects covers. Um, so the London Engineering Group have a suite of covers uh, ranging from an outright defects exclusion, leg one, through to leg three, which will give you uh, cover to replace any damaged property plus the defective item, assuming that that defective item is damaged. Um, there are also uh, the what are called the DE clauses. Again, they range from one through to five, uh, with an outright going from an outright exclusion for any any damages caused by defects to again a similar position to that of leg three, where you, the the damage caused to other non-defective property will be picked up, and the uh, and the repairs to the defective property itself, assuming that it is damaged, will also be picked up. Um, again, you know, this might be something that we want to focus on for a future webinar. OK. Um, I haven't got any other questions. I don't know if anybody else wants to put if, uh, whether the, I've got a slight doubt about yeah. the uh, chat. So somebody else has uh, Paul Lowe's put his hand up. So uh, perhaps Paul would like to ask a, ask a question. I will do, Tom. Thank, thank you. I hope you can all um, hear me OK. I, I think so in my experience, one of the perennial problems for, 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 for clients when they're faced with a potential problem or a potential claim is to kind of decide what is the right point to to get insurers involved. I think often there's a frequently there's a reluctance to turn to insurers, perhaps on based on an optimistic view that everything's going to work out okay. Um, that that hole in the ground that really shouldn't be there probably is just going to disappear. Can you guys just give say give the audience a bit of a stir as to your your experiences and your views as to when when you like to be involved if something has happened which in your view shouldn't have happened well i mean i'll i'll feel that um i mean my view is that it's it never hurts to notify your insurers as soon as you become aware um just in terms of of, of insurers being allowed to undertake proper investigation uh, by being told at an early juncture is, is a major, major aspect. You know, people undertaking contracts and works, um, ultimately those contracts get completed. The, the project team disbands. Some of these people might be uh, overseas residents, for example. It makes our job of investigating losses significantly more difficult and challenging if we're not told about them in, in fairly short order. Um, I've also had an example where a client has, you know, eventually told us of an issue um, and it, it's been, a, you know, probably a, a number of months, if not years after it happened um, and maybe just assumed that it would be picked up by the insurance, which again, there was severe questions over that. So the, the whole issue over damage and defect. Um, and actually, I think our advice to them would be, well, would have been, I should say, you need to pursue a contractual remedy against your subcontractor for this issue. And of course, then it was very difficult to, to do that with any with any great sort of um, uh, focus at that point. I don't know if that answers your question, Paul. I think um, when when Tom, we gave a presentation back in February, and I think Tom Thornbury mentioned um, of Zurich, Mentioned, I think the, was it the average time between a uh, loss event happening to notifying the insurer was something in the order of like nine months or something like that. It was a significantly long time, and you know, if it's not something that you would normally do in your own world where you have, um, you know, if you had a, a flood event in your house, you wouldn't wait nine months to notify your insurer. So I would just encourage everyone to notify your insurer at the absolute earliest policy. It can't do you any harm. You're not going to be it's not going to count against you for doing yeah. it. Um, it could only act in your favour, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Also, probably uh, it would be remiss of me not to highlight the fact that some policies have have actual reporting requirements. Um, so you as, a, as an insured, you would need to need to make sure you comply with those. And sometimes they are more stringent than others. Uh, some are, you know, a condition precedent to liability. It means you absolutely must do it within within sometimes a specified period. Some are a bit more um, a bit more leeway in terms of 
of reporting matters as soon as reasonably practicable. So that's the sort of extreme of uh, of what you can be facing. But I mean, you really should check your policy wording and the requirements about notification. And and often, you know, insurers can can help and assist. So, you know, my view to this kind of thing is it's better to have two uh, groups of people looking at this particular uh, looking at a particular issue rather than one. It, it can't harm. OK. Good. I just, I'm just, a, just, just echo one point there. I think that that's absolutely right, and I say taking the lawyer's view, I would emphasise that you know, it is important to actually have a look at what your policies say. And I think that the last thing you want to be is caught out by failing to report something just because you haven't you haven't looked at the detail of the policy. Um, so no, that been my experience, and I, I think you you guys have uh, you summarised that very neatly. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, I, does anybody else have any other questions? If any, well, anybody else is thinking of a question, I've got a slight technical question because I was slightly puzzled by the um, your description of the storm damage, and and the reason I was puzzled was that uh, you um, implied, and I understand this, that the the works were affected both by damage, if you like, to the permanent works and damage to what I would call the temporary roads or temporary works. And hence, you therefore you couldn't get to the road and do, couldn't do the work. So, just wondering how you assess the robustness of the design of the temporary works in your claims assessment. Because clearly, if the contractor had spent more on a higher grade of temporary road, there might have been less disruption than otherwise. Mm, interesting question. Interesting question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we uh, we tend to sort of view temporary roads as, um, you know, they are, they have a certain sort of lifespan um, and they will get used and there, there always comes a, an issue about measuring what is the proper indemnity for those kind of things when they suffer damage. Because, you know, if you've had, you've been hauling material over them, over them for six, nine months or a year, um, you know, they are going to have suffered a certain degree of, of wear, which is expected. Uh, and that wouldn't be something that we would normally uh, indemnify a, a client for. I mean, to be honest, Tom, we rely very heavily on on our sort of loss adjusting team that would go out and, and visit those particular project sites to, to give us a steer on that. Um, we don't tend to go out ourselves per se uh, we probably wouldn't get any work done we'd be here there and everywhere across the across the world unfortunately but we do we do rely on them heavily to give us some sort of steer and determination on that um, as to uh, as to how much a contractor spends well if we're able to determine the kind of temporary road structure that's been deployed the ultimately the contractor is only going to get back, uh, what is spent in terms of putting that down in the first place it goes back to that concept of you know we pay you for what you've built so if you've built a particularly low grade temporary surface that's all we're indemnifying you for okay i get that but equally if it if he the contractor had spent a lot more money on a higher grade temporary road for the example the disruption might have been a lot less so yeah, um, yeah. I, I take i take the point i mean we can't we, it's difficult for us to to force a client to spend money in certain areas. Um, I think it comes down to um, how critical that road is as well to your project. So we see, yes, yes. Um, see projects where, say in South America, and it's an access road to a dam, and that's the sole means of getting to that project. And if that access road is out of commission, then it may not cause damage but it could cause significant amounts of delays. Of course. And I think yeah. that's where you then just obviously have to do your risk assessment in terms of when you're doing your design as to how how um, how critical that access point is. So that's where I think you just need to assess robustness that again, through a what if scenario, what if we lose that road? What, how does our project respond and go forward on that basis? And if that, pro if that road, temporary road is critical and it could cause you significant months, years of delay, then then that's what you have to build into your price and into your program to um, to to install that road. And I think that's just an assessment that the contractor has to make. It's just um, 
Yeah. OK, I mean, I, I completely understand that. And, and I mean, really what you're saying, which is true to an awful lot of what we do right the way or should be doing right the way across the industry is think ahead as to what the issues are and then make sure that you've uh, uh, made the appropriate allowances, both physical and financial, in terms of, of, of how to deal with it. Um, I mean, I can certainly think of projects that I've been involved with where we spent what might, some people might have thought was huge sums of money on roads. One project we spent four months building temporary roads before we built a single bit of permanent works. It paid in the long run because we never stopped the permanent works once we started. But it, it is about uh, investment and it really comes back to the whole Geary principle about um, um, thinking ahead, basically. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's getting up to it's about quarter to five and I think if there aren't any more questions I think if I probably think the best thing to do is if I'm just going to 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 to, to wrap up basically or I might just see no. um so yeah. um Matt, I have one question sorry so is there a question yeah uh, okay oh Abby yes go ahead Abby hi I have one question regarding the uh, documentation of the claim. So, for example, the, how do you determine liability falls on which party? And when people fill that form out to make a claim, how does that process normally work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we don't have to have a claim form per se. We get a claim submission. Um, but I, I, talking about that contractual responsibility side of things that we touched upon. Is that right? Uh, no, so I'm, I'm more uh, I'm more interested in finding out. So once an incident has a claimable incident has uh, occurred, how yeah. do you get the information do you need to in order to right. determine the claim? How is the information sourcing kind of uh, work? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so I mean, the, the important thing I think from uh, from a sort of a claims collation point of view is to make sure you isolate all the information um, that you have in terms of costs. Um, it's quite it's quite sensible to set up cost codes for various elements of your reinstatement works. Generally, as I said, we would have a loss adjuster working for us who would literally be coming down to the project site, mm. speak to the site staff, to speak certainly with the person putting the claim together on behalf of the contractor. The, lo the loss adjuster would be giving them a good steer as to what kind of information he would like to see, what technical documents he would like to see, um, contracts, all that kind of stuff. Um, you're not just left on your own devices to try and cobble together a claim. There's quite a lot of input from, from, the, from the loss adjuster in that respect. Also, from a, a loss from an insurance broker perspective, um, more and more of these policies we deal with now have what's called a claims preparation clause. Mm -hmm. So the policy will pay for you to have a uh, claims professional put together and validate and value your claim for submission to the loss adjuster and the insurers. Right, right. Because I, I imagine like the defective design sort of track, it's difficult to really figure out where exactly the error has happened. Yeah, no, I get that. I think those kind of claims, there would be, uh, I mean, the loss adjusters are, um, you know, in the main, there'll be technically minded people. There will often be engineers. Um, we would probably rely uh, on a on a client's own in sort of internal cause investigation, and the loss adjuster would review that. And if he was comfortable that that was the cause, I think that would be his his uh, recommendation in terms of reporting to insurers. In the circumstances where we feel that there needs to be more work undertaken on causation, we would we would employ our own technical uh, engineering advisors to give us. Uh, a report basically on what they believe caused the loss. Um, it, it can be it can be a little bit time consuming, uh, but I think part of the part of the um, solution to it is recognising at an early junction where that's going to be needed, not going down six months through the claims process and then going, ah, 
we need our own cause uh, expert to give us some input on how this loss was caused. Um, so yeah, it's it, it, it can be a fairly complicated aspect of the claims adjustment process, but I think if you're alive to it, you can actually take steps to get those kind of inquiries uh, underway on day one. Right. And then the other question, uh, Matthew, is regarding the visibility that you get regarding these projects. Is it like, do you have periodic reports that are certain parameters that you measure? Um, and uh, are there any early indicators from there? Is there any thing or? Yeah, yeah there is. I'm, I can see Rob's itching to answer this question because it's, I think that's probably squarely in the in the field of risk engineering, which is uh, which is where Rob works. I'll let you field that one, Rob, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, we, um, so most insurance companies um, will have their own risk engineer. So what we do is we assess um, risks, the um, projects before they are insurance is placed. But once insurance is placed, what we do is we always typically go out and visit the project. So we'll typically do this on an annual basis, but depends on the type of project and its value, et cetera. And we will always go through and the questions that we we will always like sort of evaluate the project to see whether best practice effectively is being followed. Yeah. So again, so say if we know you're doing um, tremie work with piling, we will then ask to see sort of your method statements and we will either look through to make sure you're following the best practice guidance documents um, just to try and avoid, in fact, we're here as sort of like a, a mitigation measure to try and avoid losses. And we will, you know, come to your project and try and evaluate it. And just to, you know, it's not reporting, not there just to go back to the providers and say, oh, they're doing this, doing this, change the premium, make sure the projects run smoothly and are operating to the best of their ability to try and avoid construction losses. Um, so that's what we do on an annual sort of. Uh, Quickly on an annual basis, so they can they can help because you know the benefit of what we do as a role is well, we work closely with Matt's team, the claims team, and we see an awful lot of claims. So things like the high wasted storm damage, all of this, mm. and we can sort of process all that. And then when we come to your project, we can say actually we had another similar project and they experienced this type of um, problem, um, and you may be, want to be aware of this. Um, going forward, so, so, and it will help your pro your your project. So we can sort of disseminate knowledge sharing on a, a local level, not just through webinars such as this. We can do it on a project by project basis for projects that we ensure. And this isn't just zero risk engineering that does this. This is generally risk engineers as a whole. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Abby, I think we're, that's that, that we probably need to probably call it a day then. We're sort of running uh, slightly yeah. out of time. Thank you for your questions and thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Robert, for your answers. Although uh, you, you, you had a one or two bandwidth problems then, I think, Robert. But anyway, so um, I'm just going to, um, I think uh, we will um, uh, call the proceedings to a close now. Um, just a, a couple of points um, which mm -hmm. are sort of struck me. Uh, first of all, um, I think the issue of the piling, absolutely how not to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, with Giri Mantra is, you know, if you think you've got a problem, then rather than just sort of look at it superficially and think, oh, that's all right, you actually really do need to get to the bottom of these things. And I, I dread to think, uh, and I, well, you obviously gave some numbers, but just the, the sheer well, frankly, I think the sheer incompetence of whatever went on there is is pretty amazing, and and the industry should be uh, just ashamed of itself. So just you know, as as you said, stop and pause, um, and and that's um, and that's fundamental to so much of what we do, uh, and too often uh, we don't stop and pause. So um, I think that was a really important lesson from today. I think going back to uh, the earlier point about the loss scenario session and, and Abby talked a bit then asked about um, uh, transparency and things like that. Uh, I mean, that's really important as well. And the more we can actually uh, engage um, with each other uh, and, and the more we can find out and the more that can be shared about what's gone wrong, um, the better it is. Yet we have a struggle there because um, quite a lot of companies don't want to share um, what's gone wrong. 
Uh, and of course, individuals don't want to share what's gone wrong, which is probably partly why sometimes it takes a little while for claims to filter their way up from a project to a head office, to an insurance department, to the, 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 to the insurers. And I think there's quite a lot about human nature in that, which again, we have to tackle. So anyway, I thought it was a very uh, good session and, 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 and very informative. So I think it really leaves me with um, no more than to just, uh, first of all, to thank Matt and Rob for their really interesting uh, presentation, uh, and then to thank you all for, um, for attending. I hope you found it helpful, even if it wasn't your direct subject, but uh, I certainly found quite a lot that was interesting. So thank you very much for attending, and uh, we will be organising some more of these in, in due course, and we will advise you when the time comes. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.